this uh, CLL in next uh, 45 minutes. So what I will discuss about this disease biology, how to diagnose, how do you prognosticate, what is international working group on CLL guidelines and how do you treat a frontline CLL and what is the relapse way. So this is something I will skip for now. Okay. So now let's start uh, uh, with the presentation. I have given some names uh, who are supposed to present about how do CLL present. Um, can anyone uh, who, who are assigned for this? Uh, uh, the list. Sir, sir, I'm Komal, sir. Uh, yes, Komal. Tell uh, sir, about clinical presentation, usually CLL is asymptomatic, most commonly. It is an yeah. incidental finding on the uh, in the blood reports where we have elevated uh, total counts. And uh, in some of the patients who are symptomatic, it usually presents with the B symptoms or uh, sometimes with lymphadenopathy, abdominal uh, fullness. And uh, there is an increased risk of uh, these CLL patients prone to be, uh, they're prone to infections because of hypogamma globinemia. So infections also can be one of the presentation, repeated infections can be a presenting symptom for CLL. And uh, there is uh, uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia and autoimmune uh, ITP, immune thrombocyto uh, thrombocytopenic purpura, which can be seen in uh, these patients. So clinical clinically they may be asymptomatic or symptomatic asymptomatic being more common and uh, okay. that's it sir. so so predominantly if you see the western data no it is around 80 percent of patients who are asymptomatic and then if you see the indian data almost half of them present with incidental you know incidental uh diagnosed for something else uh, evaluated and, and diagnosed CLL eventually, right? So these are the way you, they present with the lymphadenopathy, anemia, constitutional symptoms and autoimmune manifestations. Okay, interestingly, there are certain interesting aspect of uh, CLL uh, epidemiology. So it's, uh, uh, the incidence is quite variable globally, unlike other uh, other diseases, other hematological disease uh, malignancies where uh, the incidence fairly remain equal, but CLL is something which is very predominant in, in Western world and predominantly in the Northern Europe. Um, uh, that's why you see uh, big European CLL networks uh, who do lot, who do this CLL studies because CLL is very common in European countries. It is lowest in East Asian and uh, uh, typically the lowest incidence is seen in Japan. So it's, it's how, see the variability how the incidence is uh, uh, is different in various part of the world and and in India also the incidence is not very high if you compare with the uh, Western world. And CLL is one, one uh, B-cell uh, malignancy where it can be familiar, right? Um, uh, almost 5 to 10 percent can have family history. And if you compare with lymphomas, it's it's almost eight times more likelihood of having a familial, uh, uh, familial origin. Now, MBL is a pre-CLL condition, which is uh, monoclonal B lymphocytosis, which presents with low count. And uh, typically when the lymphocyte count in the peripheral blood is less than 5,000, you label them as monoclonal B lymphocytosis. And when it is more than 5,000, you say that they are CLL. So the 5,000 absolute lymphocyte count is the cutoff when you say it is CLL. Okay, so before we go to the diagnosis, how do you diagnose, we would have to understand the basic ontogeny of B lymphocytes. So you see how the normal B lymphocytes um, undergo maturation starting from the marrow to the peripheral blood to the node. And if you see cells which are progeny, they are in the marrow. Then you get a naive B cells, which are the newly, you know, new B cells, which are naive to any kind of neoantigen. And then they undergo something called as germinal center reaction when they go into lymph node after they encounter antigen. And, and after that, they mature and they form plasma cells. So this is how a normal B cell uh, uh, ontogeny occurs. And based on the type of lymphoma genesis at each level, you have different types of lymphoma, right? So cell of origin, all of you know that there is the Burkitt lymphoma, you have follicular lymphoma who have germinal center origin. You have mantle cell lymphoma, which is typically a pre-germinal center, naive B cell population. You have post-germinal center cells, which give rise to lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma or myelomas also. So, so CLL, the cell of origin is not very clear, but likely it's a pre-germinal center. And, uh, and a group of CLL also has germinal center phenotype when they get mutated. So that's why typically CLLs are CD5 positive because they are originating from the pre-germinal center. 
So how do you diagnose? So whenever you uh, see any B lymphoproliferative disorder, you dis you divide them into four major categories. B is CD19 positive, and based on five and ten, you divide them into four categories. And if it is five positive, ten negative, we can see it is CLL and mantle cell are two important differential. And this we discussed in the last class of mantle cell lymphoma. When you have ten positive and five negative, this is typically your follicular DLBL bucket. And when you have five and ten negative, you get all those uh, uh, LPLs, marginal zones, and hair cell leaking. So whenever you interpret a CLPD or chronic lymphoproliferative disorder, so how do you interpret the flow cytometry? You first see the CD19 gated cell. So you have the CD19 gating because you are looking at B cell chronic lymphoproliferative disorder. So you first you see light chain restriction. If there is no light chain restriction, these are all reactive B cells. The moment you see a light chain restriction, that means they are kappa expressing, lambda is negative, or lambda expressing, kappa is negative. That is called as light chain restriction. Then it is clonal. Now, after that, you look at 5 and 10. Okay, So if you look 5, if it is 5 positive, then you look 23. If it is 23 positive, it is likely a CLL. If you do a 200, it is confirmed to be a CLL. If it is 23 negative, it's going in the direction of mantle cell lymphoma. If it is 10 positive, 5 negative, it is germinal center. Now, 5, 10 negative is a group which will have SMZL, hairy cell, LPL. So, based on 11C and 103 and 325. So, this is the algorithm. You can use it whenever you are seeing a CLL uh, flow cytometry interpretation. Okay. So, now, clonal dynamics of CLL. So, it has been seen that every CLL has a pre-malignant MBL phage and they get a non-symptomatic CLL and then they get a symptomatic CLL phage, right? Now, uh, the growth pattern of each patient may be different based on their genetic makeup. So what it has been seen is that if you see the clonal dynamics in CLL, a group of CLL will have logistic growth, a group of CLL will have exponential growth, a group of CLL have indeterminate growth. So what do you mean by logistic growth? If you see the x-axis is, if you can see the, uh, if you can see my, uh, my pointer here, yeah. So if you can see the B and this is the, uh, this is the uh, 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 curve where you can see that the WBC count is in y-axis, x-axis in years. And over the years, if you see this, this particular patient, these, these group of CLLs, there is a rise in the WBC count and they, they plateau after some time. Now you see the third one where there is exponential growth. You can see that the, the WLC count or WBC count is rising and rising. There is no plateauing. So you see these patterns of growth in a CLL. So why it is important to understand is that you may see a CLL today which is asymptomatic. After six months, you may say raise in WBC count. After one year, you may say further WBC rise. But after some time, it will plateau. So that means important is that the growth pattern is different. It is not only the CLL, uh, uh, the WBC count that determines the progression of a disease. Some CLLs behave this way. And if you see the, clone, the clonal makeup of those group, those who are good recital genetics like 13Q and 14Q, 12, trisomy 12, they typically show a logistic pattern of growth. And if you see 17P or 11Q, which are high risk, abnormalities, they see typically a exponential growth. So this is very important whenever you decide whether to treat a CLL based on the lymphocyte doubling count or lymphocyte rise over follow-up and the patients remaining asymptomatic. So why this happens? This is something called clonal equilibrium in CLL where, where you have multiple different clones at diagnosis. One of the clone will be dominant, which is uh, another clones will be very you know, so dormant and that maintains the clone equilibrium so that CLL, the, the dominant or the aggressive clone never grows faster. So, and one other pattern of growth is linear evolution. When you treat a CLL, you select the resistant clone. So this is how it is already known and that's how the clonal dynamics changes. So if you see the genetic variables or type of genetic abnormality and their prevalence at diagnosis and at relapse, and if you can see that, typically if you seek focus on 17P, if you see, only 5 to 10 percent are 17 PR diagnosis, but when they relapse, there's 30 percent. So why it is happening? So you are, whenever they are relapsing, you are getting more resistant clones at relapse or more resistant phenotype at relapse as opposed to as present. And this is because of the linear evolution uh, of CLL. Okay, so prognostic factors. So just can anybody tell what, what are the uh, classic prognostic factor used in CLL? Anyone who was supposed to tell prognostic factor? Anoki, Sandeep, Sagar, anyone? 
सर एज स्टेज ऑफ द डिजीज रायन बिनेट एंड पी फिफ्टी थ्री स्टेटस आईजीजीएच म्यूटेशन स्टेटस इम्यूनोग्लोबिन हेवी चेन एंड ओके सो यू नो व्हाट सो सो व्हेन वी से प्रोग्नोस्टिक फैक्टर सो म्यूटेशंस साइटोजेनेटिक अब्नॉर्मैलिटीज एंड आईजीवीएच म्यूटेशन स्टेटस राइट सो व्हाट यू आर टॉकिंग अबाउट इज दिस सो फर्स्ट इज साइटोजेनेटिक अब्नॉर्मैलिटीज राइट सो व्हाट आर साइट व्हाट आर साइटोजेनेटिक अब्नॉर्मैलिटीज व्हिच आर पुअर और आई कैन से बैड इन सीएलएल संदीप it is there in the slide ha uh, in 17 sir 17 p deletion yeah is a poor prognostic and uh... yeah so i if i can quickly summarize if you see worse is 17 p you can say 11 q is bad trisomy 12 is somewhere intermediate and good is 13 q so this is how your cytogenetic abnormality at cll at presentation will look like and there is something called complex carrier type in cll just the way you have in amls but the only difference is that here you have you say complex carrier type when you have more than 5 abnormalities because that is one group which has shown poor outcome and that is on conventional carrier type so this is cytogenetics but what is staging then in cll binet and rai staging yes sagar or anokhi anyone can take wow, how staging is different than this certificate so sir they have included only the clinical picture as well as uh, uh, cbc only they have not included any cytogenetics or other factors in ryan so, binet yeah so rai rai staging yeah yeah so rai staging is one of the oldest uh, staging in cll it was it was given by kanthi rai he is an indian who is a pediatrician Uh, who gave this rai staging and this was in the era when there was only complete blood count and your clinical findings right there was no imaging also so if you see rai staging 0 1 2 3 4 mm-hmm. and based on simple lymphocytosis lymphadenopathy and this lymphadenopathy is only clinical finding hepatosplenically clinically hemoglobin and platelet count right so this is staging now this is restratification so there is something called cll ipi where you kind of do restratification the way you do in lymphomas so now apart from cytogenetics you have two important thing in the molecular which uh, prognosticates and which divides cl as well is tp53 mutation so 17p is something which you see in fish but when you do ngs or sanger sequencing you will find tp53 mutation in good of number of patients so if you do in 100 clls you will find 70 are wild type for tp53 but if you do sanger sequencing almost 14% of them will have tp53 mutation and if you do an ngs nsgn sequencing you'll get more tp53 which are lower burden or subclonal tp53 but typically if you have a 17p almost 80 to 90% of them will have tp53 mutation isolated tp53 mutation without any fish abnormality seen in 5 to 10% patients it's a very small number so this is the stand of eric eric is the european group which rec- which make guidelines for cll diagnosis or diagnostic in the molecular field and as ngs became more popularly used for molecular assessment or molecular prognosticates in the cll so they di- they 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 divide this cut off of 10% vap to say tp53 is significant enough uh, 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 for cll prognostication because 10% vap correlate with the sanger's positivity of tp53 now any wav of tp53 less than 10% the significance is unknown now apart t- after tp53 there is something called igvh mutation can anybody explain what is igvh mutation status in cll sagar what do you mean by igvh mutation or sandeep no keep no Okay, so when you can, you can see an uh, immunoglobulin receptor, so we have a constant region and a variable region, right? And the variable region, there is uh, the 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 light the the variable comp com, uh, region of a immunoglobulin receptor can undergo mutations, right? If you remember the bio is ontogeny uh, slide where I have shown that there is somatic hypermutation that occurs in the germinal center. so what they typically do is that you to compare the amount of mutation or variation with the germline mutation right 
So if the mutation rate are more than 2% different from the germline, then you say that this is mutated. And if the mutations are exactly same, the mutation rate is exactly same to germline, they are called as, or less than 2%, they are called as unmutated. So why it is important to know mutated versus unmutated? If you see the median survival of unmutated CLLs are 3.2 to 10 years, but the moment you see mutated, the, the survivals are more than 15 years. So this is in the era of chemotherapy or chemoimmunotherapy. So this is very important when you look at uh, CLL biology because I will show one report, how does it look like in our TMH uh, uh, molecular report. So this is one patient who is a 42 year male presented with each fatigability and cervical node, splenomegaly, but, and then this is the way we see our CLL uh, molecular report. If you can see CLL IGVH mutation status mutated. So what is the meaning of mutated? If you see what is written here is that the rearranged IGHV chain had 92% identity with the germline, right? So that means 8% is difference. If 92% identical to the germline, 8% mutations are different from the germline. So that's why it is mutated. So I told you anything more than 2% is mutated, less than 2% is unmutated, okay? And this is the way you get your TP53 with a bath, okay? So now, what is, how, how many percentage of CLL are mutated and unmutated? If you see 100 CLLs, almost one third will be mutated and two thirds are unmutated. So unmutated group is the predominant group. So how the biology or a growth of uh, CLL is different from unmutated and unmutated? So if you see, this, there is something called B cell receptor signaling, right? So how does a CLL cell survive in the patient's body? It is because of the microenvironment signaling. If you take out a CLL, uh, was, uh, or a CLL clone from the marrow, they will not survive, they will die. So they need that constant signaling from the micro environment. But it has been seen that the patients who have unmutated CLL, they are very much responsive to all antigens. So that creates a robust B cell signaling. That means the B cell signaling is chronically active in unmutated CLL. That's why they saw this exponential growth and, and there is a progressive growth and faster growth. As opposed to mutated CLL, they have a very selected, uh, selective response or a restricted antigen uh, response to B cell uh, receptor signaling. That's why the B cell signaling pathway is not always active in a mutated CLL. That's the whole reason why mutated and unmutated behave differently in clinical practice. Okay, so this is something called as IW CLL guideline, which this, which make guidelines for diagnosis, indication of treatment, and response assessment. So now let's see what are the basic investigation that you do in a CLL at, at diagnosis. Yes. So, so who is okay, investigation, baseline evaluation? Yes, anyone can take. Rasmi, what are the investigations that you do for a CLL patient at baseline? CBC biochemistry. Yeah. So if we can see, this is the table from IWCLL. To establish diagnosis, you need flow cytometry, and that is from the peripheral blood. You never do bone marrow. If you see here, bone marrow aspirated biopsy when clinically indicated. That is when there is an unclear cytopenia, then only we do bone marrow. Otherwise, you don't do bone marrow in CLL. Then you do serum immunoglobulin, Combs test, chest radiograph, and infectious disease. Now, if you see the additional test, based on if you can see fish you do in all conventional carrier type not generally indicated because it is difficult to do in clinical practice tp53 and igvh you do always right so this is general practice now this this column is for clinical trial so you do a little more extensive work if you are doing any clinical trial now if you see ct scan of chest abdomen pelvis it is not generally indicated can anybody explain why it is not indicated here why don't do you do ct scan uh, or do you need to do CT scan for all CLL baseline? Rasmi? Anoki? Uh, sir. sir, if there is clinical, uh, clinically enlarged lymph nodes, uh, then we can uh, use uh, uh, CT imaging to uh, uh, stage the disease, sir. According to Binet, if more than uh, lymph, uh, lymphoid systems are involved, then it becomes stage two, if more than two is involved. Otherwise, uh, routinely not indicated. Sir. So what is happened? What has happened is you no. Know, uh, so rise staging uh, was not based on CT scan. Okay, rise staging was 
the lymphadenopathy in the rise staging, if you see, is a purely clinical finding. Okay. So even if you if you're not getting any lymph node in the neck and axilla or inguinal region clinical examination, even if you get a node in the retroperitoneum, it doesn't make or uh, it doesn't upstage a rise, rise stage because it was it is not designed in a CT scan era. Okay. So typically you don't need to do a CT scan chest abdomen pelvis. You can do an abdominal ultrasound if you find any node in the neck examination to know the bulkiness. But if you're finding no lymph node anywhere in clinical examination, it's just CLL zero or I stage zero, just lymphocytosis. You don't need to do a CT scan uh, for all CLLs. But if you're doing a clinical trial, yes, you need to do because you need to monitor them. You need to document response. Okay, treatment indications. Who will tell well, when do you treat a CLL? Indications of treatment. Rasmi Soro Prasant. Sir, uh, it is a heterogeneous uh, disease, so uh, yeah. not all patients with uh, CLL need, need to be treated. Uh, but according to the international workshop on uh, CLL, uh, if there is a progressive marrow uh, failure, like uh, thrombocytopenia less than 1 lakh, hemoglobin less than 10, progressive uh, lymphadenopathy uh, 10, more than 10 centimeters in the large uh, hepatitis uh, more than 6 centimeters below the costal margin, then uh, uh, constitutional symptoms, uh, uh, lymphocyte doubling uh, time less than six months or more than 50% increase in the last two months. These are the indications of uh, treatment as they are deemed okay. as active disease. Okay, so why so why they made it so this this IWCLL indications that was given in the IWCLL working group was made for clinical trials, right? When you enroll a patient in any clinical trial of CLL, they, they, they should have a definite or clear cut indication of treatment. So these, these, these points were made for clinical trial. But in routine clinical practice, if I have to summarize all these indication into three broad headings, they are first is progressive symptomatic CLL, right? That is first thing. So if, if there is lymphocyte doubling, the patients are having constitutional symptoms, nodes are enlarging, that's an indication to treat, right? Now, what is progressive symptomatic CLL? So if you, so here, if you see the spleen has to be more than six centimeters below left coastal margin. Now a patient may have five centimeters spleen with symptoms, right? They may say that I am having symptoms uh, because of uh, sclerosis, there is dragging sensation. So it is always a symptom and a progressive nature of disease. That is first indication. Second is marrow failure, right? and marrow failure as, de as defined by this IWCLL criteria. And third is any bulky site or any external site like kidneys or any organ where CLL is involving uh, in those sites. So these are three broad indications if you want to club it into three in routine clinical for your use in routine clinical practice. So to again reiterate progressive symptomatic disease, Barrow failure, and when you say marrow failure, it includes all hem low hemoglobin, low platelet. And third is bulky disease. So typically bulky disease, what we take in DMH is anything more than seven centimeter in the longest diameter. So then after you treat a CLL, then you... Yeah. So after you uh, treat a CLL, you document response and response is complete parcel and based on the hemoglobin WBC and platelet count. So it is predominantly the response is determined by the marrow recovery and also the improvement in the lymph node size. But the, the way you are assessing, if you are assessing response in, in a clinical trial, you have to do a CT scan and then document about this nodal size and spleen size to document a CR. But in a critical clinical practice, you really don't need to document a CR in a lymph node by doing a repeat assessment. The responses were predominantly based on the hematological parameters. Okay. Now let's go to the treatment. So who is going to discuss about frontline? Sanju Arti Nachikedya. Who do you need to treat asymptomatic CLL? Sanju or uh, Arti? Okay, so I think in the interest of time, I will I will finish this class a little faster because there are a lot of things to cover. So this is a very old paper, you know, this was an era of purine analogs, chlorambucil, 1998 paper. And if you can see that patients who have indolent CLL, no indication of treatment, 
and they were treated with chlorambucil prednisolone and no treatment if you see the survival curve here there is no difference in overall survival if you treat an indolent CLL or an asymptomatic CLL but there is an improvement in progression free survival so this was known long time back that you do not need to treat a asymptomatic CLL even in the era of you know, 1998, when there was only chlorambucil, right? So after that, there was an era of clodorabine, cyclophosphamide, rituximab. So this is this is one of the first combination chemotherapy that came from MD Anderson uh, with addition of rituximab. So before rituximab, clodorabine and cyclophosphamide was the standard therapy for CLL. When rituximab came in low-grade lymphomas and also DLBCL, so it was added to CLL backbone. And this was the first, uh, I would say first, or this is the follow-up data of MD Anderson. And, and this is on 300 patients. And if you see patients who have IGBH mutated CLL, almost 50% of them were progression-free at seven-year follow-up. And if you see those who are unmutated, they did badly. So there was a clear difference of mutated versus unmutated in the chemotherapy era. So, but what, but Germans did a randomized study. So this is the data from MD Anderson, which is a single arm study. And what interesting, if you see the survival curve of D, if you see MRD was there at that time also, and patients who um, uh, attained MRD negativity and those who have IGBH mutated group, there is a plateau here. And if you see the upper survival curve, it is uh, from the um, uh, from the IGBH mutated group who attained MRD negativity with FCR. And there is a plateauing. And so there is a there is a speculation that probably these group of patients are cured because the relapses are not there after eight years. So that's how FCR became one of the standard therapy in CLL if there's a young fit patient and IGBH mutated. So Germans did this randomized study uh, of adding rituximab versus fludrapin cyclophosphamide standard backbone with the primary endpoint of PFS. And they also found a similar kind of trend that patients who are IGBH mutated and received FCR they have the best outcome and there is a potential cure like situation where there is plateauing and this is the 20 year update and this was published last year from md anderson group and if you can see that patients who are cll and they are mutated the median pfas is 14 years as opposed to those who are unmutated which is just four years and this plateauing is still there very few relapses after 10 years in a mutated group but the only downside of fcr regimen is cumulative risk of Second malignancy is typically myeloid malignancy is 6.3%. So what is the what is the issue with um, this kind of approach? So this is something which we, we used to get trained when I was doing my MD in, in medicine that if you have a CLL which is mutated, you should give FCR because there is a good probability of attaining cure if they attain MRD negativity. But the only problem is that you will not know which patient is going to attain MRD negativity after six cycles because you have to give those six cycles of FCR to understand their MRD negative. But the problem of delivering FCR is the toxicities and the risk of second malignancies. So that was the only reason why this was not that taken uh, uh, positively by everybody. And then then the issue of toxicity, as I was mentioning, is grade three, grade three, grade three, grade four neutropenia, 85% with 38% grade three, grade four infections with FCR. So we needed always a safer regimen with equivalent efficacy. And that's where BR came into picture and this is again a study from CLL10. It's a German study comparing FCR versus BR and the primary uh, endpoint was PFS with with an in, with a design of non-inferiority. So BR was not supposed to be superior to FCR but at least to prove non-inferiority with good toxicity profile and what they eventually found is that BR could not prove is non-inferiority and FCR was better than BR with almost 15 to 14, 16 month improvement in progress and free survival. And this is the longest follow up that was published again uh, four years back of this CLL10 study. And if you see those patients who are IGBH mutated, those who received FCR, their long term uh, cure is almost the long, there is a long term plateauing here also. But patients who received BR and their IGBH mutated, if you see the median PFS is almost 69 month. So that is the typical PFS that you get in a mutated CLL if you give BR almost seven, six to seven years. So this is the summary of what happened in chemotherapy era. So FCR is clearly superior to BR with significant toxicities. However, IGBH mutated group who attains MRD negativity can attain a durable remission and a cure, but who attains that MRD negativity can't predict on day one. So in LMIC setting, it is difficult to deliver FCR with limited resources. So exactly 10 years back, 
2014, this drug was approved in CLL, and that is ibrutinib. So 2014, and uh, it, it was approved in CLL who have typically 17p translocation. And this has started the era of novel therapy in CLL. And if you see what has happened in last 10 years, from 2014 to 2024, almost 10 years, there's a plethora of novel therapies that has come in uh, in CLL field and be it your BTK inhibitor, venetoclax. And lastly, in 2013, you got pitobutinib and CAR T cell got approved in 2014, March this year. So 10 years, the CLL field has changed upside down in terms of the treatment options, right? So what are the three major novel therapy that has that has really changed the landscape in last 10 years is ibrutinib, venetoclax, uh, and obinutuzumab, and monoclonal antibody. So now in the novel therapy era, so how do you look at CLL treatment and various approaches? So we have four major approaches. How do you treat a CLL? One is chemotherapy. Is it still valid? So I'll come to that in my subsequent slide to make you understand how important it is in the in, in the novel therapy era also. The second option is to give continuous ibrutinib or acal with map. And third is time-limited therapy. So when you look at option two, it is a continuous therapy of using BTK inhibitor plus minus Cobin. But when you look at time limited therapy, it is when open or when ibrutinib. And the fourth option is MRD guided approach. The two important approach in that is EK flare and CL13 dry. So I told you about ibrutinib got approval in 2014, and this is the long term follow up of Resonate 2. This is the so when it got approved in uh, in 17 p deletion in 2014, naturally it was it was it was again tested in a in a all CLL group, and the comparator was chlorambucil. And if you can see eight year follow up, almost 70, 60, 65 to 68 percent of progression free at the end of eight year. And the, and the benefit is irrespective of whether they are mutual or mutated. So this is one group of uh, drug, BTK inhibitor, where the, whether it is mutated, unmutated, it doesn't matter if you're using a BTK inhibitor. So now the question came that if you're using BTK inhibitor and the comparator is chlorambucil. So, but everybody was not happy with the chlorambucil comparator because you have better combination agents in CLL, which is FCR and bendamustine rituximab. So that's how there are two randomized studies that were done comparing BTK inhibitor with chemo immunotherapy. And this is an ECOC study, study of ibrutinib rituximab with FCR and a, and, and, and a calgib alliance study with bendamustine rituximab. So I have enlisted both the studies. And if you see, this is the calgib alliance study where ibrutinib was compared with bendamustine rituximab. And there was a third arm also when the rituximab was added. So if you see the long-term follow-up, this is almost after six years, important thing is there is no difference in PFS between both the ibrutinib arm. So the rituximab addition to ibrutinib didn't make any difference in uh, if the ibrutinib. But if you see the mendamus in rituximab arm, so it is clearly inferior to the, the ibrutinib arm. So it was clearly superior in terms of progression free survival. But if you see the overall survival, it is still similar. So if somebody may argue that even if I'm using a bendamus and toximab at upfront and the patients cross over to ibrutinib, we get equivalent survival, it is, it is absolutely okay. Now, if you see the toxicity is almost 20, 18% patients develop atrial fibrillation at the end of at the end of seven to eight years. And that is significant because these patients will require some form of you know, uh, beta blockers and, 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 uh, and uh, anticoagulation. But if you delve into various risk group in this Calgib Alliance study, how, how was the benefit in various subgroups? So if you see the left side is the group with the greatest benefit. If you see the TP53 aberration group, the hazard ratio was 0 0.07 naturally. But if you see the IGBH mutated group, the hazard ratio was 0.48 and it was just crossing unity. And there was no OS advantage. So likely in an IGBH mutated group, there is no OS advantage, financial toxicities of giving BTK neuter for long. So that's where it is questionable benefit. But if you see the greatest benefit is in the TP53 and IGBH unmutated is somewhere in between. There came the acalabrutinib data. So obviously when you have BTK inhibitor one group, you have got second generation of drugs which better potency and less off target effect so that the atrial fibrillation rates are less. Because with ibrutinib, the problem was you were almost 17 to 18% used to have atrial fibrillation. So because of the off-target effect on the heart. So you need a better TKI to have less off-target effect. So that there came the calibrutinib para. So now this study is again a phase 3 randomized study of three arms of adding obin, versus obin as opposed to rituximab and comparing with obinutuzumab and chlorambucil. 
And if you can see that the resistance was clearly superior to the control arm, there is there is no doubt about it. But one interesting thing that came into was that there is a difference between Ovin alone versus uh, versus sorry Akal alone versus Akal plus Ovin. So likely an Ovin tuzumab, and remember Ovin tuzumab is only being used for six months in the initial phase, but it is clearly making a difference at the end of uh, four years where there is a clear difference in progressive the survival. So it's a better CD20 molecular antibody instead of rituximab, probably when you are going to add to a BTK inhibitor. The issue with OBN is you require hospitalization. So the, the USP of a BTK inhibitor was you don't need hospitalization, you give treatment to patients on OPD basis. But when you add OBN, you get a bet, better PFS, but you need to hospitalize. So then what better option? So why don't venetoclex obinitozumab? So then came the era of venetoclex-based resume, where OBIN with venetoclax was compared with again OBIN with chlorambicil. And if you see, again, it is 12 month of therapy with OBIN to Zumab and venetoclax as opposed to OBIN to Zumab with chlorambicil. And if you see the long term data, clearly it is superior to the control arm. But if you can see that in the group which is unmutated, they did better. And if you compare the data of TP53 mutation, 50 month versus 20 month, but if you compare that with the BTK inhibitor, the BTK inhibitor data looks more better in TP53 group as opposed to the Ventoplex group. So this is how the serial protein trial came and this gave to another option of treating patients. So now in the era of novel therapy, you have got three options here. One is Ibrutinib, Acalabrutinib and Ventoplex. They were never compared with each other in a phase 3 randomized study, but there are certain pros and cons of each approach. So if you're using Ibrutinib, it is one of the longest follow-up. It has good activity in TP53. It was compared with FCR and and it is uh, the, the problem with ibrutinib is its cardiovascular toxicities. Now, what is the advantage of ibrutinib is very few off target effect. And one important thing is that when you add an OBIN or a rituximab, or a bit, uh, rituximab with acalabrutinib, it is it improves the progress and survival. Now, the problem with acala is you have to give twice daily, you can't give protoplasm inhibitor when you are giving acalabrutinib. Third option is revenetoclax based, which is time limited, no cardiovascular bleeding risk, but you need to monitor this patient for tumor lysis, you need to hospitalize these patients. So there is almost 50% risk of grade 3 grade 4 neutropenia. So all these three approaches are there in the novel therapy era, but if you see the efficacy more or less similar uh, with each other, the only thing is that it's about the logistics of duration of therapy, cost efficacy, and toxicity, how they differ. So what is next now? So the next is, whether you give BTK inhibitor or when obinit to Jumab, one side one size may not fit for all patients. What typically happens with the novel therapy is that you can continue novel therapies for long without any long-term toxicity significantly, right? So now the advantage of this is to achieve a deeper response. And if you achieve a deeper response, you can obviously prolong PFS. But how long? Now the problem is that you can give BTK inhibitor with rituximab, you can use BTK inhibitor with venetoclax. But at some point of time, you need to stop these therapies when you get adequate response. So what is the time point when you stop? So that is, that's where the MRD approach comes in in novel era and you attain a deeper MRD clearance. What happened in ALL? In ALL, you attain a deeper response, prolonged response and a persistent MRD negativity cured patients. So can you do that in, in CLL also? So that led to a whole lot of new kind of studies where you have time limited therapy using MRD in CLL. And they have got two important approaches, UK flare approach and CLL 13. So this is the UK flare trial where, where FCR, see the stand control arm, the control arm is still FCR even in the in the in the novel therapy era. You know why? Because it has still you have, have not shown an overall survival benefit with the use of novel therapies in CLL because all these patients, when they cross over, they attain equal survival. So now if you see, uh, there are three arms. Uh, so I'm not going to discuss about the ibrutinib comparison with FCR that was already published in Lancet. And there is no difference in overall survival. Of course, there is difference in progress and survival. But the study that here, what I'm discussing is the MRD guided approach. So they, they exploited this MRD guided approach in the third arm, that is ibrutinib and venetoclax. So how did they do? They monitored peripheral blood MRD every six months. And if MRD is negative, repeat MRD after three months, and they did a marrow and prefer at the same time, and if all these MRDs were negative, these patients, these patients continued uh, their combination therapy for another equal number of years. So that is what is what is happening here is that if a patient is taking say two years to clear the MRD, then they take they give another two years so to make it four years. So they just double the duration of uh, uh, therapy. 
the time which which they take to attain MRD negativity. And what is the uh, why the stopping rule? If you see that patients who attain MRD negativity and the time they take to attain negativity, they need to give the, the prolonged duration of therapy. So this was the basic premise why the UK applied ibrutinib venetoclax arm was. This is complicated, but if you see the third arm, patients who received ibrutinib venetoclax, they received somewhere between two to six years based on their time of MRD negativity. Okay. So now this study got published in NEGM this year, and if you can see the difference, 97% three-year progress in free survival, and this, this is the reason why this paper is in NEGM, as opposed to 58%, if you see, uh, if you see the FCR arm, the arm is clearly inferior. But interesting thing is that 58% patients are off therapy in the ibrutinib venetoclax arm, even if you use a, a MRD-guided approach. But if you see the mutated group, interestingly, there is no benefit yet, and pro probably the predominant benefit is driven by the IGBH unmutated group. So in, in venetoclax based approaches, your IGBH mutation status matters. Whenever you're stopping therapy, your mutation status matters. But the moment you're containing therapy, like the way you are continuing BTK inhibitor, indefinite therapy, probably the mutated unmutated group behave similarly. So second approach of MRD guided approach is CL13, where what they did is that they added triplet. So now you have three musketeers. You have got obinutuzumab, you have got PTK inhibitor, and you have got ibrutinib, meritoclax. So if you give three drugs, so G stands for uh, obinutuzumab, I for ibrutinib, and B for meritoclax. And if you give three drugs, and you and again you do an MRD at nine to twelve months, and and from the peripheral blood, and if the two MRDs are negative, you stop BTK inhibitor. If they are not negative, you continue for three months. So that's how the ibrutinib arm got uh, uh, got this ibrutinib. It is not clearly the MRE guided approach as was well EKFLA, but it is more or less a similar kind of MRE driven approach. And if you can see the result, the triplet of using three drug was clearly better, 85% PFS as opposed to the doublets. And if you can see the difference is if you only use k therapy, four year PFS was 60% as opposed to 85% in the third arm. So now, if you compare that with other approaches, it looks better. And if you see a fixed duration of using Ven Ibrutinib from other studies like low and captivate, it is not that great. But if you use an MRD guided approach, it, it is better. So what I think from this MRD guided approach in CLL is that if you are using more than one noble agent upfront, it should be a, in a goal to achieve more deeper response or MRD negativity. That can probably lead to cure in CLL. As you have seen from this uh, from this data of UK flare, almost almost 100% patients are doing well at the end of three years. So if you really want to exploit using more than novel agents, achieve for MRD negativity, which is better whether it is CLL 13 and UK flare, it is the, the winner is out, but likely a CLL 13 triplet approach better MRD clearance with lesser duration of therapy. So now in current era, how do you select your treatment? So if you see, if you have a patient who is TB53 intact, no comorbidities, mutated, still FCR or BR makes an, an important option in the off-front, but preferably a BR looking at the toxicity profile. But if a patient has TB53 mutated or disrupted, then probably a BTK inhibitor is a better option. That's the preferred option, but if you can't give BTK inhibitor for any reason because of any comorbidities, say cardiac comorbidities, then a ven based approach is a better option. So any patient who has a TP53 mutation, then a, a novel agent has to be used. Now coming to IGBH unmutated category, that is one group where probably uh, a, a new novel therapy should be considered, but if it is not possible, a chemo immunotherapy is still fine. Now, in all this, in the in the era of novel therapy, when you are giving continuous therapy, when you are prolonging the progress in free survival, but at the end overall survival remain the same, how do patients select and how do patients prioritize their uh, therapy? And, and that is also when you took, took into account the out-of-pocket cost of those therapies when you continue. So if this is a very interesting survey done for all patients of CLL and how do, do, do they rate the PFS benefit? And the PFS benefit was graded from 10 months to 60 months. And this is the score or weightage they gave to that benefit versus if you can weightage is plus and minus based on whether it is positive or negative. And it, it take into account the PFS, the duration of therapy, even mild toxicities like diarrhea, because if you're taking a drug for lifelong, even when mild toxicities become very important, chances of serious infection or organ damage. And what patient gave credence is the PFS they give highest weightage, but also they get importance to the out-of-pocket cost for these treatments when you continue this therapy, which will be the cost efficacy analysis. Now, coming back to this patient, I think 
this one group where probability is mutated and, and anything which is chemoimmunotherapy is fine in the group of patient. So now how do you treat relapsed CLL when they progress after they receive chemoimmunotherapy? So in, in, in our uh, practice, when you get a low risk or a standard risk CLL, which is TPP3 wild type, uh, IgV is mutated, you give chemoimmunotherapy. But after they fail, you have got two options. Either you use a BTK inhibitor or a fixed duration when obinutuzumab. But when they progress after that, what are the options? So, so, we, so we have got multiple options in the term of using different kind of BTK inhibitor, typically the non-covalent BTK inhibitor. So I'll come to that what they are. And also re-challenging them with venetoclax and also using chemoimmunotherapy when they fail. Okay, so this is one randomized study in the relapsed uh, refractory space called Murano study where bendamustin rituximab was used as a control arm and when rituximab was used as an experimental arm and with a primary endpoint of progression-free survival. So at the seven-year follow-up data, you can see only 23% patients are following with ben rituximab, but with the median time to next treatment was five years, right? So five years is the typical duration of disease control they get if you use ben rituximab at, at first relapse. And But if you see these patients, these patients will eventually progress and almost three-fourths of them will progress by the end of seven years. And the PFS also depends on the type of disease as well. Uh, if it is unmutated, TP53 aberrant and genomic complexity, the PFS is less. You have data for using only when monotherapy in CLL and that with an overall response rate of 70% with, with, with at least a four year of disease control. So typical BTK inhibitors are covalently binded, but there is a group of uh, uh, CLLs which are non-covalently binded, which bind to BTK space and they remain active in a situation where you have a covalent BTK inhibitor, you have something called a C481 mutation at the tyrosine kinase uh, domain. And those patients develop a resistance to BTK inhibitor and they progress on BTK inhibitor. So pitobutrinib is one interesting drug which uh, has a no, no, no covalent way of attack, attacking the BTK site. And if you see the data of, from Bruin study, almost 80% patients do respond, but the median progress in survival is around 19 to 20 months. The median follow-up is short, but you get uh, at least in one and a half, a half year of PFS with that. So what is new? So our so CAR T cell therapy um, also is uh, uh, used, and as I said, that it was approved recently this year uh, in in Jan. So CAR T cell therapy is one of the first therapy that was uh, that was used in CLL, uh, and this is a 2011 uh, paper from Carl Jones lab, and this was data of only two patients who received CAR T cell therapy in 2011. And remember, you got first novel therapy in the form of BTK inhibitor in 2014. So this was at the era of chemo immunotherapy. And, and af what happened after that was that the enthusiasm in the CAR-T space went down because you had BTK inhibitors, you had Benetoclax, Obin. So the therapy moved more towards newer novel therapy. And there was other, another issue with CAR-T cell therapy in CLL is the T-cell exhaustion because the data subsequently was not very great in, 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 in the CAR-T space because the quality of T-cells in CLL are not really good and they are typically the exhausted uh, phenotype of T cells where they don't have good persistence. But you know, the, interestingly, the 2012 22, the, they're the same group who, who did CAR T in 2011. They published their data on two patients after 10 years, and these patients had persistence of CAR T even after 10 years. And they, when they found why these patients have persistence of CAR T even after 10 years, they found there's a typical group of uh, CAR T which have only CD4 positive cytotoxic phenotype. So typically your CD8 uh, cells are cytotoxic, but a group of CD4 T cell which are cytotoxic can persist for long even after 10 years. And that is the reason why these patients are doing well even after 10 years. So that led to using lysocell. So lysocell is a different kind of CAR T where you use equal proportion of four and eight uh, T cell where you, you kind of manufacture four and eight differently and then mix them and then you infuse patients. And the typical hypothesis is that you have these eight cells which have these initial responses and these four positive cytotoxic cells can give you a long-term remission. So this is the transcend serial four data which has led to approval of CAR T and serial space. And if you can see, it's an open level study, almost all patients are BTK refractory, 70% are Ben refractory. But if you see the complete response rates are not very great, only 20% patients are achieving complete response. But the patients who are achieving response, you can get two years of uh, at least uh, progression-free survival if they achieve a CR. But the CR rates are pretty low. So th there is a lot of things to be done in the CAR-T space in, in, in CLL uh, because, uh, because there is a lot of scope in that particular situation. So now coming to conclusion. Okay. So to conclude, a couple of things that I will recommend you to go back and read because uh, 
I could not cover everything in detail. But when you diagnose a CLL, look at that differential of CLPD. I have given you the algorithm. That algorithm will be very useful when you interpret the CLL flow cytometry. Now, international working group of CLL criteria is important indication of treatment. Remember, there is no benefit of treatment in asymptomatic CLN and you proved that in 1998. The risk stratification is important and more important for, for us in LMIX. So if you if you ask uh, someone from Europe or you know, in the Western world, they say that there is no role of chemotherapy in CLL now. Everything has to be novel agents. But for us, when you know that you have a group of CLL, one third who are mutated, who are low risk, who do, will do well even with chemotherapy. So we need to have those certification and baseline to prognosticate them and, and, and looking at the cost efficacy. Now, even in the era of novel therapy that I was saying that chemotherapy therapy has not been beaten. So why I say not been beaten? Because no novel therapy has yet shown any survival improvement in this particular low risk group where chemotherapy and you know, novel therapy, the survival remain the same. Now, MRD adapted therapy is likely the future because with the more and more novel agents you are using in CLL upfront, your goal should be to achieve MRD negativity because that can lead to a potential cure in CLL the way you have achieved in the ALL space. So with that, I finish. I think we can take some questions. It you have five minutes left. So anyone who want to ask anything, please unmute and ask. Sir, for the MRD guided approaches. Yeah. Uh, what was the uh, method used? Was it uh, flow MRD? Was it uh, NGS? Yeah, it was. Yeah, so there are multiple methods of MRD assessment in CLL, but the typical method that is used is standard flow based method, and that can be used anywhere. And you know, the sensitivity is less than 10 to the power minus 4. That means any CLL clone uh, less than 1 in 10,000 event is a negative. So, in that much, you can achieve anywhere with a very smaller you know, uh, uh, panel also. So it is doable by flow cytometry and typically it is done from peripheral blood and it's confirmed in the arrow, right? Okay, thank you, sir. So importantly, Rohan, that uh, MRD guided approaches are coming up and this is very recent in last one year. But as I said that MRD guided approaches are not still the standard uh, uh, approach because uh, you have seen the UK flare approach, you have seen the CLL 13 approach, the way they have used MRD guided approach, but you need to have those long term follow up data uh, uh, to understand that, okay, this is the way we need to treat all your patients of CLL. But definitely there is a group of, CL, uh, group of CLL where you want to use MRD guided approach, uh, but probably it is not for all patients. Thank you, sir. Yes. Sir, uh, yeah, Ritam. In there are uh, BTK inhibitors and BCL2 inhibitors where we can get yeah. a prolonged PFS, almost yeah. nearly curable. Then, what is the role yeah. of stem cell transplant uh, right now? For yeah. CLL? So yeah. So so this this question typically comes up when. Uh, when you get a young fit CLL and uh, and a TP53 mutated or 17P deleted uh, CLL, where you know that with the current available therapy, you get uh, what is the median survival of a newly diagnosed CLL? 15 years, maybe 20 years based on that risk. But if it is a 17P, maybe it is it will be lesser. So that's what you could think. But the problem the problem is that you have effective therapies up front, right? You have BTK inhibitor, you have venetoclax, and typical dictum is let them fail these agents because once you fail BTK inhibitor and venetoclax, after that, what is left? After left is pitobotanib, right? So if you see the pitobotanib data, it is one and a half to two years of median PFS. The CAR T cell therapy is there, but it is not again something which has shown great benefit in terms of in the CLL field. So that is one point where you start thinking about an allergenic stem cell transplant. So in current era, if somebody has failed chemo followed by a two important novel agent like both venetoclax and BTK inhibitor, that is the situation where probably you will think about a stem cell transplant, but not before that. Anyone? 
Any other questions? Good. I think it was very well covered, Lingraj. No questions left for them. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I think I really like the nice touch on the clinical biology of IgG mutation. And that's something which is very important. And uh, I, I think the basic uh, premise is the cell of uh, origin or the kind of uh, CLL you see in IgG mutated and unmutated. These are two different diseases. And that's why they don't uh, change. We don't have to uh, retest the Thank you. Okay. Okay, so I think we can close the session. Thank you all. Thank you, sir.